when you really master the martial arts, you truly have become a guardian of where you live. Welcome, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 512, with today's guest, Shihan Charles Garrett. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and everything we do over here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. You're going to find a bunch of stuff over there, including our store. And if you make a purchase and use the code PODCAST15, you support the show, and you save a little bit of money. The show itself gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We put out two new episodes every week. We give you access to every single episode we've ever done, all for free. And why do we do that? Well, we're trying to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. That's our goal. It's our stated purpose. And if you want to support the show and that mission, you can do a lot of things. You can make a purchase, like I already mentioned. You could share an episode. You can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. You could tell a friend, pick up a book or a program, maybe leave a review or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. That's where you want to go. If you think the shows we release are worth 63 cents a pop, not to mention getting access to all the back episodes for free and all that, consider supporting us for as little as $5 a month. If you do, we're going to give you bonus material, including an exclusive episode every month. If you step it up from there, we give you more and more and more. Or you could support for as little as $2 a month and you still get access to some some behind-the-scenes stuff that we release nowhere else. So consider that, patreon.com slash whistlekick, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I had a great time talking with Shihan Charles Garrett. We talked about a lot of things, of course, his history, how he got started, all that. But we really talked a lot about lineage. There are times when that aspect of the conversation doesn't come up a lot. But here it was. It was very important. It's clearly very important to Shihan Garrett. And we spent some time talking about who he had the opportunity to train under. It's a name that you may recognize. And I thought it was a great episode. Wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you do too. Shihan Garrett, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, uh, thank you, sir. It's an honor to be on here today. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. You know, an audience, we were, we were just chatting. We were chatting for a bit. And, and as you might imagine, uh, quite often when we get guests on the show, we have conversation before we start. And sometimes that conversation starts building up so much momentum that I, I kind of have to pull in the reins. And that's it's almost what I had to do with you today, sir, to say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait for the good stuff. I felt like we were just about to crack into some really good stuff. So I'm, I'm excited for our conversation because I, I, I think we're going to go some interesting places today. Well, it, it's an honor. Uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Pohan Sokum Sensei. Uh, when I initially got into the arts, it was because of my drill sergeant in basic training in 1967. So any of you meet as well learn karate, go to Okinawa. Well, uh, I got that opportunity. And when I got there, I meandered around Naha looking for a place to join in. But I had a back operation a year before. So many of the dojos I ventured by, there were people being slammed to the ground left and right. And my back goes, out, out. So lo and behold, I would bypass those dojos. And then by my fortunate luck, I'm looking out my barracks window up at Yozendaki and Air Station. There's a little old man teaching about 20 GIs. And it seemed to be a class that just started up. And I watched it a couple of days, but I was still wondering about going back down the mountain to Naha and looking for a dojo. And each time I come back up to Yozadashi, I see gentlemen teaching. And I go, oh, I'm going to jump in. And whoa, I've really jumped in. Uh, it's, it's really unique the longevity that the martial arts will bring to its practitioner. And if you practice in the what right way, uh, the individual themselves become very uh, gracious with what they've learned and the concept of no first strike. I was taught self-defense. And self-defense means oh, you don't attack. Somebody attacks you and you take care of. And so that was uh, my beginning journey uh, 
October 1970. And this coming October, I will be on my 50th anniversary. Wow. I've been married more to my karate than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remind her of that? <laughs> uh, I don't have to, but uh, <laughs> I mean, she, she, she knows this. And uh, my, my, my wife is Okinawan, so uh, very Ooh. fortunate that I took her to Master Sokens. And she said at least 10 or 12 times. Uh, she says, you know, it's unusual even for an Okinawan to go to an elder they don't know and for them to be relaxed. But Master Sokin seemed to be a specialist at that as well. He really taught the art as something for your life. Not, not for, oh, I got my black belt, don't need anything anymore. No, no, no. You want great health, and the art does it. Master Sokin lived to be uh, 92. His uncle lived to be in his 90s, and Monsumur Sokin as well. And uh, yes, the island of Okinawa kind of brings out the elders in the world. It's pretty well known as uh, the, the region with the most elder individuals. And it's just interesting when one of those elders, when you're 25 and you're learning karate from them, they could kick your booty so easy. But Sokin wasn't that way. Sokin, oh, gee, you know, this is really, it's almost sad. Oh, it is sad. He, he presented a system that is carried down from the originator, Matsumura Sokong. But the Okinawan that was following him, sad to say, didn't convey and teach the kata forms in the way Master Sokin had. He really presented uh, Shorenji Kempo and a little bit harder concepts behind the system. Uh, if anybody's had an opportunity to view any of the videos of Master Sokin on the internet, you see this gentleman at 83 years old, just so free and motion, just so easy. And, and yet, uh, we'll, we'll go to the first time I had contact with Master Sokin physically. I was in the class in my second week, and we're in our Chudan Uke block, and they're counting off, and Sensei's to the student to my left, and lo and behold, he steps in front of me and lets me know, hmm. I'm going to punch at you now. Uh, but he, he didn't speak English. So I had just finished my left shoot on uke. So I'm going to be blocked with my right. So he throws his right punch. I come out with my right uke. And as my right fist is about my left hip side, I'm thinking to myself, take it easy. He's an old man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> he knocked me backwards and just laughed and went on to the next student. That laughter. At the end, I mean, we, we've we've heard stories like this, right? It, it's kind of a a classic. The idea that you know the inexperienced martial artist is learning from someone that that seems to be a senior citizen, someone that warrants maybe holding back, especially I would imagine with the mindset of someone in the military. Yeah, and it yields, you know, for those of us who've been training a while, you know, maybe a little bit of an expected result that that. There's some some humbling happening, but the laughter that you just mentioned, that's a new piece of the story for me. And it it sounds like just from the other pieces you're you're saying about this gentleman that that might be a theme. Am I right? Oh yes. Oh it ended up being because see, uh, when he came up with that laughter when I was on my right shoot on Uke is because of it's my first experience in pain as well, right? And so your acknowledgement of learning something new. And so later on, it equates to, and you'll see in my slide section, a picture where Sokin is doing a nerve point on Woody Lyons' uh, limb. And uh, at the same time period, we barely, barely, barely got within that picture what we called his Yiddish grin because he, he would smile in, in this manner, letting you know, 
did you understand that? You got that? This is important, you know, but interesting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you, your knees buckle and your body sways downward, uh, yeah, you better have learned something. And I still prevail with doing the same thing with my students to this day. Uh, my 12 year old grandson knows the whole system and he's learning very well. And uh, our New Year's workout in January, I was doing nerve points on his right limb. And then I asked his sister to come in with the camera and video his full arm closed because Charlie is kind of a comedian and he, he really shows the reaction in a, in a fast manner at times. But when you look at his limb and you see my nail print digging into his <laughs> three or four different parts in his arm, you understand, oh, Charlie had a reason to go down. <laughs> I've trained with a lot of people in humor. I don't, I don't know that I want to make a sweeping generalization here, but there does seem to be a correlation between humor and at least what I've experienced as the better martial arts instructors. Would you agree? Is, is there something there? Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, you, you, you hit something there in a way. Uh, there are people out there, and you can probably find people that really have a dastardly idea of me and don't like me, and you'll find out they don't have humor when they teach. Instead, they have this uh, buffalo attitude. Mm. I'm just going to run you over and, and smash you, and I don't care versus uh, when I teach, I want to make sure my student, even on the first day, has learned something to defend themselves. And even on the first day working out with them, there's going to be laughter in the class, but there's going to be a real hard, serious time. And I think when you, you bring just a shade of the humor in, it brings a more natural relaxed feeling with all students mm. and it's it's difficult because uh i was in a small class with master shokan i i've only had a few large classes and uh when you have a larger class you end up losing the closeness with a student as well and maybe this is why some teachers will find a few students in the group that want to work out a little extra and then they probably be a little bit more fortunate uh because when you have a multitude of students you have to stay a little bit more serious maybe but when it gets down to just a few you you can get a little more humorous with what you're doing and uh, when they tag you you know i've been tagged a few times and i don't care and it's just like right now, because of this COVID-19, I haven't had arm contact with anybody for a couple of months. I haven't been hit in my abdomen. My legs haven't been hit. My body <laughs> is losing its natural adrenaline of accepting energy coming in. And uh, uh, if you get some time with Michael and those at uh, uh, NIMA, you'll, you'll hear about me teaching the soft chi concepts our art forms uh, well one individual he's in goju do i ask him where do you feel chi oh the hair in the back of my neck stands up um, okay okay uh, but yet they're unable to feel it between the palms of their hands like in a Tai Chi ball, and like in doing Reiki. These are all natural things. Uh, Master Sokan, when he taught us Pasai Kata, at the end of Pasai Kata, we have searching hands. Sokan taught us to do it slow. And when you do it slow, you can feel the Reiki of the hand over top. You can feel the energy. And uh, now when I teach that, though, I brought another part into it. So maybe you can bring this in with what you're teaching as well. But when you're doing the searching hand slow, let your thumb point down at the arm as the hand goes across. And what's really funny, if you become aware of your soft chi, 
you'll feel the ripple of the hairs from your palm, but with your thumb, you'll feel one direct pinpoint line going down your arm. And it's these energies that when people become aware of them will help give them more power. Uh, but at the same time period, uh, I don't see a lot of students laughing when I'm playing with that. Uh, Raymond Guthier's son, uh, Junior, uh, he, he came out to Sacramento in the late 90s. And uh, he was very, oh, I don't believe in that. I'm, I'm, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Lo and behold, I'm, I'm doing the searching hands across his arm. And I'm watching his eyes and face. And all of a sudden, well, there's something there. Uh, everybody's body emits energy. And uh, depending upon your mindset and type of individual and attitude, if, if, if you're that ape out there, the apes will never feel soft chi because they're too hard and dynamic in what they do. Those that are relaxed in the manner of their form and kata will feel the energy that's there. Uh, but in Okinawa, almost 48 years ago, I felt the Reiki across my arm. And I did not know how to ask Master Sokan about it because he spoke Spanish and nobody in our class spoke Spanish and he spoke Hogan or Uchinagusi, the Okinawan language. And uh, we didn't. But uh, the uh, years later, uh, I understood what to say, but it was a little bit too late to speak with him about it. But I just convinced an Okinawan that the first move in Kusan Ku is really Okinawan's Tai Chi. And only if you do the movement real slow will you feel the closing or collapsing of the ball when your palms come together at the end. I felt that same energy again 48 years ago when I was learning the system. So uh, the manner and how Master Sokum brought the kata's to us and had us work out I naturally became aware of this energy. When I ventured with others in our sister style, lo and behold, uh, they're too hard, they're too dynamic, so they can't feel this soft energy. And to me, it's the best thing to keep us from having to get in a fight because our energy tells us automatically where the disturbance is. But then on another hand, we have a requirement as being a guardian because when you really master the martial arts, you truly have become a guardian of where you live. And you have to learn to protect those that need to be protected because they don't have their own ability. And so I've done that a couple of times. Uh, thank God that nothing really came out about it, uh, everything wind on down. But our arts, oh gee, is really for our health and for ourselves. We, man needs to know how to focus and get centered on what they are doing. And in our modern world, we have so many activities, we get lost in what we are doing. And, the same thing, though, would get in sometimes teaching the karate. There's so many different things to look at when you're doing kata. Uh, one of the greatest things that I, I kind of like when I'm teaching uh, new schools is really more of the soft chi because it makes them aware of their internal power. And uh, 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 Nima's head instructor, Michael, uh, aren't, I'm sorry, he's haunching now, right? Uh, Mr. Sartwell, I think is, I think he still goes by Sheehan. Okay, uh, cool. I believe there, I believe there was a promotion not too long ago, but I don't, I, I'm not quite sure well, from what to what. Okay, well, I'm, I'm probably at least carrying with Sheehan, you know, like myself, uh, 
individuals. I've had a lot of people in the past week call me master. Uh, I'll write back at them. Please don't call me master. Call me sensei or shihan or kiyoshi. Uh, but I can't get to the level of ability of my teacher. So I can't see myself sitting with a, a, a haunchy level, a 10th degree. And this is one thing that we could really laugh about is that, whoa. In the Matsumura Shoren style, there's got to be 10 to 20 tenth degree masters. And it shows, in my opinion, individuals that are really id oriented versus people that want to teach and share. There's uh, uh, 10 to 20 different grand masters in one system. Uh, it's it's not the way it is supposed to be. But there's been respect lost somewhere, and I try to continue and keep things rolling as proper and open-hearted and friendly. Uh, Ramona Hastings Hanshi, uh, uh, she just told me years ago, Charles, Charles, uh, uh, don't make let people take advantage of you. And it, it comes about because I share everything I do. Uh, when I teach, I teach my utmost because uh, my family is very well known for heart attacks and strokes. And years ago, I had a motorcycle where, that did 155 mile an hour. And everybody in my family has been 155 miles an hour. And a lot of my friends, <laughs> they're hanging on for dear life, trusting me, you stupid peoples. But lo and behold, it was a survivable period. But my mindset was, I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. So when I teach anyone, I want to teach them the utmost from my heart and spirit. But then on another hand, oh, one of my students recently, Regal, oh, this gentleman, Regal Gomez is doing just so great. Uh, he, he bypassed getting his teacher's credentials this past year. So he, he should be pretty well ready this year. And it was just his own mindset that wasn't ready. But uh, we're working Kusan Kukata. And uh, when we're in the codes of Dosh, the supporting bot, snap kick front and spring up in the air and drop to the ground and leg stretch. Oh, he wasn't doing the, the technique proper with his hand. And I'm asking to go through the technique. He, he, he did do the block. And so I ended up throwing a, a toe kick and it got him just below the siphoid. And Rigo was out cold almost. He goes, Sensei, you, you barely hit me. I go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm, you know, now this is what's really cool. He, he's one of my first students that's always compliment me when I hurt him. <laughs> that's a good student <laughs> right there. Oh, my goodness. I mean, but, but I, oh, darn it. I do not feel good when I hear that, though, all right? Uh, and I don't want to be hurting my students it's the enemy we want to hurt but in order to understand your wazza we have to go through some pain we have to understand what it does do we have to knock people out no i'm sorry you really don't have to uh so i'm, I'm really glad that master oyata uh, put out his videotapes on the knockouts uh I have a, his, a few of his students and a, a few others that are just really great with those. Uh, I don't want to be doing that with my student to show, hey, this is what's going to happen. Uh, because it's self-defense. You have to do full power strike. If, if you do too many partial, you're not going to, you're going to get hurt in the long run. You know, a woman, if she doesn't learn to hit hard right away, and let me tell you, Oh, like years ago, going back to Nemo's Dojo. Uh, let's see, what was what was young lady? No, not Karen. Oh, 
oh darn, I can't remember her name right now. It comes to me, but uh, when I was working out with the dojo, we have this uh, trunk twist exercise, and I walk behind and let them hit my arms as they're blocking behind them. And uh, when I come up to a young lady and into class, I've mentioned this young lady, you're, you're better than these guys. You hurt my arms more. You have better technique than the men in this class. And, you know, everybody was really kind of, kind of, kind of surprised. But she, uh, a young lady seemed to understand owning her position or owning where her block is, her owning where her punch is. And what I'm meaning is that, uh, when you step into an individual and you still keep your stance, you don't lose none of it. When, you block on them or try to move their body back. Your position is just so proper that uh, they lose out. But you have to own your grounds. And when you're able to do that, as this young lady did, it's just, whoa, uh, inspirational, you know, and sometimes laughable to, go, to, to see that she was striking and hitting harder than the men in class. Uh, our kata, our kata are so important. Uh, I've been chastised by a whole lot of people. Oh, Garrett Sensei, why do you not change your kata? You're supposed to change your kata. Your kata's supposed to evolve. No, 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 no. I was taught by Master Soak, and he was worried about his style dying. And he was correct because his follower did not carry on with his kata. So I continue as Master Sokin taught. And now I'm finding out, uh, I'm hoping later this year to meet a gentleman named Kano Sokin. Uh, may have come across the son of Master Sokin, who is still alive. Hmm. He's 91 years old, lives in Argentina. Uh, my friend had just introduced him to the Sakagawa family in Hawaii, and he's been in Hawaii for a few months, uh, especially since the COVID-9 uh, virus has come out. Uh, Kano Sensei was very mad seeing so many people that were supposed to be, you know, they're all advertising Matsumura Soken Karate or Hohan Soken Karate. Okinawa and Shuren, much more Seito Karate, but he looked at their kata and goes, that's not Sokin's kata. And then he goes, Garrett Sensei, you're the only one I see that's doing kata the way I was taught. Now, uh, Kano was born in 1929, so he, he, he got probably a good decade with his dad. And you know, oh, he's emphatic about don't change kata. Myself, I only felt that it is your bunkai and awareness of concepts and ways in the kata that would change. Mm -hmm. But there are many, many practitioners, oh, well, you're supposed to change, you're supposed to change, you know. And I, I, I'm just an old goat the old way, and that's how I want to keep it, the old way. To me, you know, when, when because I, I can see value in both. I can see the value in keeping a form the way that it was taught to you. I can also see the value in, in changing it. To me, I'm much more inclined to keep things the way that they were taught to me. And, and you know, maybe there's some variance. You know, there there are, are forms uh, like Kusanku, which actually is my, my favorite form and the cool. one that I'm most prone to compete with. Uh, there are some, you know, I, I've got a slightly different version that I will compete with versus the one that I will do when I'm training. But to me, I think of it like a song. You can have the same words and the same notes, and it can still be very different than the next person singing that same song with the same notes and the same words. Yes, yes. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah. There's just so much that we, you know, the... We we watch Master Soak in, in the Super 8s, and to see the smoothness from one move to the other, and uh, 
just last week, I'm uh, so, uh, writing to uh, Okinawa Master in Okinawa. He had a promotion class, and so I was complimenting the students and so on. And then I went into a private discussion with him versus a public one. And, uh, you know, that, you know, I was really broken hearted that there's nobody in Okinawa uh, teaching Sokin's way at this time period. And uh, then it, the, the other side of it, the, the new sport karate, every bow is the same identical hand technique. And my, myself, and I, I could never see how is it, uh, they just put palm over palm and no interlocking thumbs. And, you know, that's a good block in directly, but when you have your thumbs interlocked, like we, I was taught from Sokan, it brings up to myself a lot stronger of a waza and more pinpointed. But uh, what I'm seeing that scares me is they're so hard and robot manner. Uh, there's there's not the fluid, fluid fluidity and flow that should be there. But then, of course, uh, we're talking about 180 years difference in time from when one Matsumura system was made to the present day. And so the, the evolution in karate is, is there, and it's evolving to sports because money, money, money. <laughs> That's yeah. been my – I've never been interested in making money from it. Uh, I, I do charge a small amount of dues or whatever, and yet I still have students that haven't paid dues in years. Yeah, yeah you're certainly not the only one. And it yeah. doesn't hurt, you know. Uh, I don't know. Why is it just the rich man can do something, right? You know, uh, the, the individuals that don't have... Oh, here, here's a good little story for a student that didn't have money to pay for dojo, I say, hey, Tom, uh, I just mowed my lawn out front. Uh, will you go rake it for me? Oh, yes, sensei. Oh, Tom scurries out front. Uh, I think the Venetian blinds were open just a hair, and I, I saw Tom get the rake, and he walks over to one section in the yard. He bends over, and he picks up a single blade of grass, and he walks to his left 10 feet and he sets that blade of grass down. And he did that a couple of times. And then he started raking. And when Tom was done, hey, Tom, uh, what were you doing? And Tom was kind of baying. He put his head down. I'm sorry, Sensei. And Tom was kind of, you know, sad to say, I mean, it was, 25, 30 years old at this time, but when he was a kid, his dad beat him. And so he'll bow his head, curl his shoulders and stuff, you know, really getting ready to get hit from his paw for doing something wrong. I go, well, Tom, what, what were you doing there? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I was hoping that he was going to say, I'm thanking the grass for the nutrients and food that is put in the air for myself so that I can breathe. And I have respect for it, for helping me. Uh, so I told him, I said, hey, next time I talk to you, and if I ask you that question, give me that answer, okay? I would really love to hear that answer. That's why you picked up the single blade of grass. <laughs> I want to I want to hit rewind. I want to I want to rewind a ways because Please. we jumped in to your story at at the start of your martial arts training. Okay, but something tells me, and and, and longtime listeners know that that you know I. I I play the odds with this one. You know, I, I get a pretty good feeling most of the time that there was something in your life prior to your training that if when we look in hindsight, we can say, you know, maybe, maybe this person needs martial arts. What was it about your childhood? What was it about your life prior to serving and having the opportunity to train that we might say, you know, Martial arts might have fit even earlier if you'd had the opportunity. Uh, well, let's see. 
I, I was a scrawny little kid without a question, but my eyes and mind never saw that. Uh, you know, in 1958 or 59, I went for a drive in a 57 or 55 Thunderbird with my dad and my cousin, and I was in the back window cubby area. And there was hardly any room at all there. So kind of giving up, you know, for being 10 years old, I was awful small. Hmm. But uh, I wasn't I picked on a little bit in school, but uh, really never got my butt kicked. Uh, I've got three older brothers and uh, probably more fighting with them than anybody else. And it, it probably helped me fight better. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody about you know, my first uh, fight from uh, in junior high was over a comb. And uh, I was being called out by two one guy really big and one guy closer to my size. And we went to the telephone company to punch out after school. And I did a, a right left combination on him. And then the big guy just took off running. So I didn't have to fight him. So I was like, all right, all right. But you no, know, what really got me uh, into karate uh, was watching the Green Hornet and uh, the drill sergeant in basic training. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to war. I did have orders two times for Vietnam, but because of my big mouth, I didn't end up going to Vietnam. Uh, I had orders to go to Weijambo, Korea, and because of communications with U.S. RADCOM and knowing the master sergeant in charge and my big mouth, uh, I was allowed to go to Okinawa. And that came about because of one of my friends wanted to be an officer. And so I did paperwork uh, from my job to see if he fit the requirements for OCS and if he had the aptitude, all the scores and vacancies and so on, and he fit. And so I'm putting in his app application for OCS, and I go, hey, remember what the drill sergeant said in basic training? Didn't he say, if you want to go to Okinawa? And so I put myself in for Okinawa. Well, four months later, I got sent to Chicago. Uh, and I was stationed at Travis at that time period when I put my application in. But I went to travel, uh, travel to Chicago for the air defense system there. And so uh, I'm only there two months, and I come down with orders for Weijambo, Korea. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that was really a job I did not want to have because it's right on the DMZ line. and. It's a place where GIs don't rest. And uh, I think Vietnam would have been better than the uh, North Korea D DMZ line. Uh, but no, uh, when I called up U.S. RADCOM, spoke to him, he uh, talked about my two different orders. And he said, well, if you want to go to Okinawa, that's where you'll go. And so my adventure started. And, you know, being in the military, and my brother, when he he had told me before I uh, I signed in, he says, "You do whatever you can to stay out of Vietnam." My brother just got back from Vietnam, playing dead, and Charlie Kong kicked him and rolled him over and got into the news, and everybody in the news after that event in '65 got a bullet in the head. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're going to go to a war zone, you better be ready to fight. My brother did do hand-to-hand -hand combat in Vietnam. So I expected the same for myself if I got sent there. So I was just looking for preservation of, of myself more than anything, I think. Hmm. You've spoken pretty highly. I mean, it, it, as highly as anyone has spoken of anyone uh, when you've spoken about Hold on, Sokin. Uh, Master Sokin, oh, gee. Uh, uh, I wish you could see the picture. If you go on Facebook or see any Facebook postings I've had or my one webpage, uh, he came in and out of his dojo 
through his bedroom window because his dojo was built on the back of his home. And uh, there's a metal chair at the window where he comes and goes through. And the window sill is just an inch or two below the top of the metal chair. He would venture in and out four times a day, probably, back and forth. And uh, this one day, his right foot's on the windowsill, his left foot's in his bedroom, and his right foot slipped into the dojo. And uh, I think there were only three of the four of us that were there that day. And we look at each other and go, wow, he got wish almost got wishbone. His deep pants didn't even touch the window sill. He flew over like a crane. He went over with such ease, like nothing had even happened. And when he came back, he acted like as if nothing happened. But coming back was tea for us. Because every day at the end of class, he would serve a cup of tea for each of us. And then we would have little discussions or uh, sit. Uh, he would sit and watch each one of us do our kata one by one instead of everybody together. Uh, and you know, he he didn't beat a student down like I've seen some Americans do that have oh, come out from underneath his wings a little bit. They weren't totally his student by no means, like myself. Uh, Oh, very fortunate myself and the Yosadaki students uh, were only taught by Master Sokin, so we didn't have any other style input. Uh, but there's a few others that were really brutal. And when they work out with their students, they're even more brutal. I don't know. Uh, I kind of look at it this way. One of my friends, he was going through a Matsumura dojo and the Bronx or Brooklyn area. And a student been in there, a gentleman, uh, 25 or so, doing an Og UK with an arm way up in there, but his underside of his bicep wide open. The teacher goes up and hits him on the other side of that bicep hard and just drops this guy. And my friend says, yeah, he, he left and never returned to that place. I go, yeah. Teachers that teach brutality like that, oh, I think they're afraid of their student being better than them. I want my student to be better than me. There is not one student I've had that I don't teach them proper enough to beat me. I teach them to beat me as well. Uh, but yet, uh, I don't abuse the students. We'll, we'll go through, we'll, we'll learn the nerves and stuff, but uh, I, I think some people are just too afraid. There's one gentleman wrote a book about him being a, a first student, Fise Kise, and, you know, a tenure student, Sokin Sensei, but he doesn't do anything Sokin does. But he does a lot of what Kise does, and, uh, you know, he says a great karate cop, a great master in swords and all types of weaponry. But he loves to socialize with too much alcohol, which brings about people who just want to fight. And uh, really shouldn't just have fun fight with karate other than in dojo with fellow students. You know, karate should be for your self-defense. And uh, to to see, you know, this is one of the things that really separated Master Sokin and, and Kisei was the fact that Kisei has students going to bar, fight for money for Kisei. Kisei get money, not students. And Master Sokin, he frowned on that. He 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 didn't like that. Uh, he was so adamant about no first punch, no first strike. Self-defense only. Oh, uh, the other day I went out. Uh, I had a pretty good association lately with my Makawati board. And my Makawati board's, well, going on uh, 44 years old, 45 years old, Redwood Post. Oh. And it sounds like I'm hitting a board with a hammer. 
And when I got done hitting mock waterboard left and right and shoot those, I'm thinking, I don't want to hit nobody. I never really want to have to hit somebody with those knuckles that are developed. That's not the idea of the development, you know, but, uh, oh, gee, no darn well the damage that would be caused. And uh, it's really kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll go back almost 50 years ago when I got my brown belt in Okinawa. Now, uh, uh, Master Sokin, when he did the promotions for everybody, he wouldn't sell you a certificate for every step. That was Kisei's way. Uh, but Sokin, okay, Song Q was the highest ranking in green belt. So that was our first color belt at Song Q. And the second one for brown belt was EQ, uh, but brown belt was second and EQ. And so I get my brown belt. I got big heady. What a dumb. That was so dumb of me. I took off on my motorcycle that. It wasn't that same night, but it was after I'd been promoted to brown belt. I go down to downtown now looking for some skirmishes. I really was. But I wasn't doing it like the barroom brawl type, trying to make it, right? Just trying to get somebody to jump me or whatever. It, it didn't happen. Hmm. When I got back to Yozadaki, though, and the next day I'm thinking, hey, uh, that's not a good idea to run down there because those guys know karate too. You, you think those guys down in the district don't know karate? You know, uh, this is during the Zagunru strikes in Okinawa, and uh, there would be 10 or 15 Okinawans at every gate with the staff and a flag on it. And, you know, the staff isn't intimidating when you see the flag, right? But when the staff by itself, we understand, oh, battle. And, uh, it kind of reflected on me that, oh, hey, those guys are out there with the, the staff every day and so on. You're, you're wanting to pick. Okay, don't do that no more. So that was my last adventure of intensely trying to get into it. As we've talked about your story here, I don't think we can understate or rather overstate the importance of what seems to be a very chance encounter that you end up on Okinawa, you end up viewing the classes from this one man. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, Curious, have you given thought to how your life might be different if it had been someone different teaching or if your orders had taken you somewhere else? Uh, Do you ever yes. wonder about that? Oh, yes, I have. No, because I've reflected back to my Taekwondo. Okay, I'd be in Taekwondo if I didn't get the orders to Okinawa or uh, Tong Sado or whatever. And I've been doing it for 50 years. I have had a hip replace and a shoulder replace. Uh, and the hip because it, it, it cracked, uh, shoulder from old age and stuff. But if I really had gotten into Taekwondo and Tong Sudo, I would have had the operations a lot sooner. And I probably wouldn't be as active right now, maybe. Uh, it, it seems like a lot of the hard dynamic styles have a hard time uh, pushing into their 70s because of the locking up of the tendons and the extension of those limb, limbs to their fuller. Uh, there's a gentleman that got with Master Sokin who was with Pise, and uh, he was one of the barroom brawlers and so on, but lo and behold, he developed his own style, and in so doing, every kick was a lockup in the hip area as well, all right, and the knee. And uh, once you have learned to do that kick properly, you only need that total lockup, you know, one out of 20 times maybe, one out of 50, but not every time because of what it would do to the joints. So uh, I. And it's really fascinating uh, when, when we look at what the martial arts will do with one's health and recovery from operations. I've had 
two back operations since doing my art. And I was typically full active within a month and a half or two. Uh, when I had my hip replaced, I was home within 47 hours of, as, or as I put it, they cut my leg off. <laughs> 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 it was the same, you know, I had my shoulder replaced. I said, well, you know, when they cut my arm off, because <laughs> at one point they really are cut off. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to nurture them back into position, uh, the martial arts develops a drive that's inert to none. You know, and the power is just so great depending on your mind with it. But uh, the healing aspect. Our breathing exercise enhanced my healing so fast. And I've been emphatic with the breathing for decades and decades. And to utilize it in my own healing, uh, when I had my shoulder replaced, I would sit and do an inhale to the center of where the shoulder joint was, and then exhale, uh, Legs uncrossed, palms open, and let the energy just flow out of my limbs. And inhale, center, exhale out. I would swear up and down there was a balloon in my shoulder. You know, even uh, people I've spoke to in the last month and a half that I've done some healing uh, courses with, uh, I'll talk about. Yeah, I'll swear up and down there was a balloon in my shoulder. Really, really. But what's so fascinating? Because now with more reading, one of my students uh, really. Uh, a book nerd and he's pushed me a little more and got me into this one Chinese medicine book and the Chinese medicine doctor talking about your lower back pain. Everybody gets lower back pain and pain in the back, pain here and pain there. And this Chinese master emphasizes breathing to your lower tendon is needed to alleviate that lower back pain. And, uh, to, to see how the healing has gone for myself and my operations, I go, yeah, I agree. And then it talk, gets in talking about the molecular development within the body. We're, we're, you are able to really talk to yourselves in the body. You can tell them what to do. But you have to, have, you know, just like believing in Jesus, you have to have the faith. And when you understand the breathing and what it does and how it increases the oxygenation in your body and when you direction it to the area of injury it follows it it works and, uh, a few of my students that have helped in that manner and they, they see it work and they go wow okay okay but to recover sooner is what i am seeing See it. There's no doubt I've recovered sooner than the average Joe Blow on all the operations I've ever had since being in the arts and so on. And it brings me to surmise that the martial arts, the greatest essence of them is the breathing. Not the hard physical workout, but the proper breathing. That is where the essence is, because when I teach the soft chi concept side, it's not muscular. It has nothing to do with the muscular side. It has to do with your thought and so on. But uh, our breathing is so important. Uh, one of my students, I spoke about him earlier, Rigo Gomez, great gentleman. Uh, he really got into weightlifting when he was a young teenager, and he pushed it and pushed it. And now, when he inhales, uh, he can't inhale longer than six or seven seconds. And uh, I related to him that I felt that it was because when you got in with your muscle development younger, you built your upper body and your muscles and limbs, and your muscles pushed down in your abdomen. Now, what's really crazy, because I told him this a long time ago, the Chinese book that Mark uh, Bessius had me read equates to the fact that that's exactly what's going to happen. If you don't have uh, the right breathing in your lungs initially, and he did hard, heavy muscle development with dumbbells, 
it keeps the lower diaphragm from being able to expand because there's too much muscle in the area. And so they end up with shallow breathing. Shallow breathing will be the death to us. We need deep breathing. You want to live longer? Uh, practice. Well, I, I, back in the early 90s, I utilized the move from Goji Shokata, the rotating palm. And I, I did it when I was with Nima years ago, too. But when inhaling, rotate back. Exhale, rotate forward. Your inhale should be the same volume of air as your exhale. They should be the same time and duration. But I really feel that is the essence to the healing and longevity. I completely agree. Now, for those people out there who maybe don't have the opportunity to learn much about breathing, or for those maybe who were never taught how to teach breathing, but they have schools. How might you yeah. advise them? Well, see, it's something so easy to do. All right. So, you know, uh, John, I had a great web page up to January, and then the guy that built my web page uh, turned around and wanted to play uh, uh, hijack me or something. Mm. You know, if you don't pay me more money, wait, you weren't building my web page for money, and now you're demanding money. Oh, okay. But, uh, I'm starting another a good YouTube channel and you know really to teach the rotating palm from Goju show and breathing and then have them as well facing the palm because this is something you just say right over the phone and they can understand but facing your palm together two inches apart and inhale inhale slow and don't bring your hands no wider than two inches past the width of your body Exhale, bring them back together. Don't let them touch. And it all works and gets that energy going. Uh, these are the things that should be shared and shared openly because it's the essence to survival. Uh, or when we get out or we get sick, I don't knock on wood. Uh, I'm pretty fortunate. I, have been, I haven't had a flu since I could remember. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, but then, of course, I live in Sacramento. I don't have your cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> that does help. That does help. We uh, we had snow. Uh, we've had snow the last four days. Yes. Yeah. All four days in a row? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you're in the cool land. You know? That's for sure. But yeah. see, Sacramento, though, gee, uh, we haven't had frost here in several years. We used to always have frost. We haven't had snow now since the turn of the century almost. I don't know. Is that climate warming? <laughs> I, I don't know. But it's, it's. I mean, it's. it says something. I don't know what it says, but it says something. Yes, there it is. There. Well, thanks for discussion. You know, just, just, you know, one style versus another style. Okay. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not the styles. That makes it. It's the practitioner. Uh, now, then, on another hand, uh, I I have found that the manner of how Master Sokin taught his deshi, and I try to follow with, is really one fast, uh, developed, combative individual. Uh, I think there's a, an essence to the organization plan. Uh, I see, okay, Master Kise had 27 basic exercises. Master Sokan, we had maybe eight in place, and we had seven or eight stepping combinations. And then kata. Master Sokan really emphatic about kata and so when we get in tournament against Fisei Kisei 
Master Shokan class always win in Kata division. In Kumite division, I really took first place, but Kisei was referee and uh, he didn't want to see his student lose. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I sent him a, a, a photograph album so stating that too, because uh, what, what happened was I move into his student. I do a low snap kick to the guy's left thigh. And the guy dropped both his hands, both fists, to block the kick. And I hit him in the face. And all I had was leather gloves on, regular army leather gloves. And we got the men and dough on, right? The head cage, right? And that kid's head goes snapping back. He said, no point, no point. He touched his leg. And we go at it again, and I did the same thing again. No point, no point. And uh, right after that, his, his students, point, point, over. <laughs> uh, but I got a little bit of that on video or Super 8, you know? I like it. But, Great. you know, uh, it was just kind of fascinating. But when I saw Kisei, okay, Okinawa, he didn't really know me other than that tournament time. Uh, in 2004, I went to Okinawa, but in mid nineties, one of my students, uh, had to go there for a TDY job. So I gave him a photograph album, uh, my, uh, karate flyers, pictures from the beginning to the present at that time. And, uh, on the back hard page cover of the photograph album, uh, I, I wish you and your family all great health. Da, 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 da. I still disagree with you officiating the tournament in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> but when I saw him in 04, he was glad to see me. When he saw me in 06, he was glad to see me. Oh, there was one other time. Okay, in 99, I rode my motorcycle out to Colorado Springs for Jeff Ader's uh, camp with Pisei Kisei. Um, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed of all those guys. Really. Uh, everybody there for promotion. All the black belts are looking at the other black belt for the moves in their kata. Mm -hmm. And when I get in and I talk to them about it, I'm finding out they dump their kata. They kind of got the kempo mode. Hell with the kata, you know, just do kumite or whatever. But they only practice the kata that they're in promotion for. So they dump the other katas. And I go, no, 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 no. You do your Nahachi Pinyon. And then when you get to your new kata, do your new kata too. But don't drop your kata. You, you go backwards a little bit. But oh, I was, I don't know, I guess Kisei was used to that or whatever. So I guess it's not so embarrassing. But I, in fourth degree students that couldn't do their forms. But what was really kind of fascinating, uh, right at the beginning of the class that day, I'd already uh, spoke to Kisei for a short time. He says, Isa, Isa, Kono, Sokan Seto, Isa, Sokan Seto, Sokan Seto. <laughs> that was so funny. But uh, that was kind of comic, comic, like Jeff Ader kind of uh, got bothered by me talking to Kisei that day. And uh, uh, so I didn't bother him for the rest of the day. The next morning, he said, Jeff Ader, give me a chair. Charles, son, oi, day, oi, day. come over here, Charles, sit here. I stayed with him for the whole day during the karate time. <laughs> and all, uh, he asked me, hey, uh, Sukumbo Kata. Let's do Sukumbo Kata, uh, no bow. And so I did uh, Sukumbo without no bow, right? And we're doing it together, though. And he goes, oh, we're still same. We're still same. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, he, even though he didn't follow Shokan, I, I don't have no hate for the gentleman by no means because he's done what was important to me. And what been important to me is that Master Shokan is known in 100 or 200 years. Because of the Kenshin Khan, or now they call it Matsumura Seto, and they're far from it, but they are carrying his name and legacy on. 
indirectly. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's better than so many others. Yes. With no yes. continuation. Yeah. Let, let's flip the clock a little bit. We've talked a lot about your past. We've talked you know, a bit about what's going on today. Let's talk about the future. You know, if you look out 5, 10, 20, however many years you want to look out into the future, what are you working for? What are you hoping for? If we were to reconvene at some point in the future and update our conversation, what would you hope we'd, we'd be adding on? Whoa. Well, I'm waiting for having my roads crossed with Master Shokin's son. Uh, when uh, I first heard of Master Shokin's son, I was really, okay, uh, can't wait until father and son circle is finished or happen. And then instead, though, which is really greater, is the Matsumura and Sakagawa circle first. And then son and Deshi circle. Uh, I'm not into large schools by no means. I, uh, I'm wanting my grandkids and a few of my students to carry on. The classes should be pretty parallel to what happens now. Uh, and primarily the stories of Master Sokin and certain things that have occurred through the system in itself. It would be great to finally see uh, others finally want to talk to me or hear from me. Uh, I got on the internet back in the mid 90s talking about Kise Kise's Kata, Master Sokin's Kata. And because of Kise's student, I was known or knew that his cottage were different, but not all his students know that or knew that. So all, and a lot of his students has come out with hate for me. And I wasn't trying to put TC down. It's just, he does his cottage different. They're, they're not Sokin's way. Uh, I, I posted it, I think, uh, on, a, on another page last week as well, that you know I've been out here open, wanting to share things with Master Soak, and I put out his Super 8, uh, vid, Super 8 photos online for people to see, and I get so few questions uh, to understand how to be soft and fluid. Uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe with my stupid ego inside, thinking that, well, uh, because I learned from Sokin, there's other people are going to want to talk about, right? But it really ends up that there's been too many people that said they were with Sokin that weren't. But if there's... I, I'm hoping I got another 10 years. Uh, the doctor says I only got about a 20% a, a chance for another 10. Uh, but she doesn't know the karate that well. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but I, I'm I'm striving to reach Sokin's age, and that is ten years from now, from when I met him. Uh, if I'm able to still pug, and I use the word pug for Edgar Robux since they, uh, he's the gentleman that took the photograph album of PC Kise, and he saw Sokin and studied under Kise in the seventies, but passed away. But I got to carry on uh, great individuals like himself. And, he always called it pugging, you know. I'm going to still punch it out with him. I'm still going to block. Uh, hopefully, I've been able to uh, get a text finished by that time. Uh, I mean, there's so much. You know, I, I, I see everybody's written text. Uh, they're, they're karate, but they don't talk about what's really happened in the dojo, you know. One of Master Sokin's favorite exercises would be the knee bends or squats. Because the Okinawans learned to squat real early in life because uh, that's how they always had to go benjo. Uh, myself, I was a baseball player and I was a catcher. So being a catcher, I always squatted. So it was easy for me. 
but soaking them and laughing. The GI's not been able to squat down. Uh, but no, it. I I would be real happy in the martial arts field. Like, get my text done up, and uh, as well uh, working on redoing all my slides and everything else for 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 getting out into the world again and online where it's going to be there for a while. But what would really be cool as well is to see a little bit more familyness between style versus hate. Uh, because see, the attic, too many teachers uh, with their id, I'm so much better than you. I'm so much better than you. Well, so what? I don't, it's okay that you're better than me. Don't you understand that fact? <laughs> you know, uh, what's important is what type of sharing you do with your betterness. Or are you hoarding it? Uh, uh, Masamura Sokon, part of his scripts that survived the war, uh, uh, spoke about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But at the same time, stating that when you learn something, share it with, in his case, it was village at that time period. Uh, and so, uh, in this case, for ourselves, it would be our neighborhood. Uh, I think when people are glutton, glutton for too much money behind things, it changes the system and things. Uh, uh, it's very understandable. One that has to make their monthly income from teaching. Uh, myself, uh, I've probably taught more free than I have taken in any money. And uh, I just enjoy what I do. And if that part could be passed on to others, to learn to enjoy what you're doing. This has been great. I mean, you, you've, you've really carried uh, a pretty strong theme through here as we've spoken. And I, I suspect anyone who's listened has a pretty clear window into you and to who you are and what's important to you. And, you know, of course, that's the important or rather the goal. It's my yeah. hope whenever I have a conversation with someone. And it almost feels hollow to, to pose this because I, I don't know what's left, but my, my gut tells me there you can always find more. So as we close up a show, I always ask the guest, how do you want to end it? What are your final words that you want to leave the audience with as we roll out here? During our lives, just like in karate, we, we have different levels. Uh, as I, uh, one of the methods I presented years ago, and I have uh, formally had it uh, public or anything, draw a little pyramid and think of your teacher as being at the top of that pyramid, and you're at the bottom of that pyramid. Uh, this is what I did decades ago, thinking of Master Sokin. He's at the top of this pyramid. I'm at the bottom. And I'm thinking, of, whoa, I'm doing 99.9% .9 physical here. Wow, look at Master Sokin. He's only doing 1% physical. Because you need to add another pyramid inverted from the top, going upside down. So now you have an inverted pyramid where the base of the pyramid, where it hit my baseline, is that's how much physical? Only 1% physical? And you're 99% mental? Oh. Now what we need to do is draw a vertical line through both points of pyramid straight up and down and let it bypass. Put one hand over one side of the line. You look to the right and you see an hourglass. Every thing you do in life shall take time. It's not going to just jump and be right there. No, no. It takes time. And don't expect it before the time has hit its point. 
Now we uncover the left side, and now we look at the right, and we cover up the opposite, and now we look at the opposite side, and we see another, not an hourglass this time, but two roads. And the two roads are the good and the bad, or the giving and the taking. But what's really beautiful, the two roads, you could always go back to being proper. But it's very hard when you're always out there taking and not sharing. So if you learn to share what you have learned so that others, especially the others that are totally unfortunate, don't have the money or the resources or the capability to get there. Uh, some people recently have said, well, I've, I've, I'm in a wheelchair. Well, that's okay. I could teach you the whole system from a wheelchair. Don't have to step around. But understanding that whatever road you are on, it is you have to go with the attitude that is the right road. And you got to prosper with the right attitude. And keep taking a step forward for more knowledge. Don't stop striving for more knowledge. But Tomodachi, friends, Tomodachi, friends, Tomodachi, friends. See what I mean? That was a great episode. Great conversation about lineage and history and connections. We talked about past guest, Shihan Mike Sartwell. We talked about quite a few things. And I want to thank you, sir, for coming on. Great conversation. I appreciate your time and hope that we can connect at some point in the future. For those of you listeners out there, go to whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Find the show notes. Based on the numbers, quite a few of you don't do this. Check out the website. It's worth it. We put a ton of time into it. You're missing out. What do we put over there? We've got photos and links and videos and transcripts. Sign up for the newsletter. Tons of stuff. It is worth it. I promise. And if you're up for supporting us, the work that we do here at Whistlekick, you've got some choices. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you do, use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. You could also leave a review, buy a book, or support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. And if you see somebody out in the world wearing something with Whistlekick on it, say hello. Maybe you'll make a new friend or a training partner. And if you have suggestions for guests, let me know. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love your feedback. I love your guest suggestions. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.